Well, it's good to see all of you this morning. A couple of things before we dive in today. Uh, first of all, right after this service is our next open house. And so if you're new to our church or been kind of coming for the past few weeks, you want to know what's next, that would be the next for you. And so it's immediately a follow the service. We'll feed you. Take care of your kids. It's back in our student room. You'll hear my heart, mission, vision, values of the church. Get a tour of the church. Meet our staff. And so if you're going, how do I get plugged in? This room is great, but what's next? That would be a great next step for you. Uh, also, we've got our fall Bible studies kicking off. And so they have a table out there in the lobby. So men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies, married. Um, it's a great time to jump into that. Um, and specifically uh, for you ladies, uh, next Sunday is our well gathering, which is a quarterly gathering for, for ladies and uh, your friends to show up here on a Sunday night, uh, worship. There will be a message, be a special event, and then a really great way to get plugged into Bible studies in between each event. So really easy, awesome opportunities to get plugged into our church. They've got tables out there in the lobby. Would encourage you to, to swing by. Now, uh, we are in the middle of a series called The War Within. We kicked it off last week, and here's the whole premise. It's the idea that you and I have uh, junk and issues and dark places in our hearts, souls, and minds that if we had the courage to go there, that if we had the, the guts to, to dive into that and allow Jesus to change us, to heal us, to restore us, these next few weeks could be some very, very life-changing, eye-opening things for you. If you'd have the courage to not live a surface shallow life, to not have a surface shallow faith, but to go, you know what? I'm gonna hold my breath and I'm gonna jump into the dark areas of my heart, soul, and mind, trusting that Jesus will heal them and restore them. Gosh, these next few weeks, they could really be uh, life altering for you. And so today, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, while you're turning there, I'm gonna read some verses that the Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy. And then I'm going to pray for us and we'll dive into the message. You go to Luke chapter 12. I'm going to read out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. This is Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy. Here's what he says. Paul says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I pray that in this moment, that the spirit would begin to move in our hearts and souls and minds as it has been all morning long. I pray not only for this room, but the students and the kids. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to change us from the inside out. God, point out the dark places in our hearts and our souls and minds. Give us the courage to wade into them. And Lord, give us the trust that you will change us from the inside out. We love you, Jesus, and ask these things in your name. Amen. I need to divide the room up into two groups. The first group, I just need to know by a show of hands, how many of you, you would consider yourself board game people? Like you love a good board game, a card game. If it's game night at somebody's house, you're in by a show of hands. Okay, okay, put them down. How many of you, you're like me, you think game nights are dumb? <laughs> you're my people. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Brianna and I, we follow them both. I think they're dumb. I don't like them. I think they're pointless. Brianna loves a game night. She loves board games, card games, doesn't matter. If it's a game night, she's in. If she's in, candidly, I'm out. Uh, and the reason why is because she gets very, very competitive on board games and game nights. And I know she looks very, very sweet, but when she plays board games, she's out for blood. So... Uh, we just kind of, you know, separate those two things. Now, I grew up playing board games. I get it. We did all the board games, Monopoly, Risk, you know, Sorry, all those things. But there's one board game in particular that I remember, and maybe you remember as well. The board game was called Hungry, Hungry Hippo. It's four hippopotamuses, and there's marbles in the middle, and the little tails were like levers, and you slam them as hard as you possibly can, and the Hungry, Hungry Hippo just went out whoop, and just kept eating as many marbles. Now, the game lasted like 15, 20 seconds, but it was an intense, high-anxiety game. Because you're there slamming as fast as you can and trying to get as many marbles as you can. Then you realize everybody else is getting more marbles. And so all of a sudden, did you have enough marbles? Did you get enough? When the marbles were gone, the game was over. And then you counted up and whoever had the most marbles won. And that, I think it's a pretty good metaphor for the life that you and I find ourselves in. On one hand, we want more, 
We gotta get more, more time, more money, more influence, more house, more car, more things in life. But then when we don't have more, we don't get enough, we oftentimes circle into this downward spiral of worry and anxiety. Do I have enough? Did I have, do they have more than me? Why do they have more than me? Why didn't I try harder to get more? And so this idea of more and worry are very often interconnected. We want more things, and again, this is not something that you and I broadcast publicly. It's, it's in the dark spots of our heart. But we want more, more things, more opportunities, more money, more influence, more friends, more. And when we don't get it, we downward spiral into worrying, going, well, did I, do I have enough? Did I get enough? Do I need to have more? The idea of more and more. So here's the, t- the two ideas I want to address today. There's this idea of the meaningless pursuit of more, and then which is often connected to the wasted moments of worry. Meaningless pursuit of I've got to have more, followed by the wasted moments of worry and anxiety and do I have enough. And today, we're looking at a teaching that that Jesus gave, and he talks about these two back to back, the idea of more and the idea of worry. And Jesus says two iconic phrases, two iconic phrases and one's a phrase, and actually one's a rhetorical question, but the, the two are, are the, I'm gonna give them to you, that way you can find them in the text. But the first thing that Jesus says is, life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then later he would say this rhetorical question, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Life is not measured by how much you own. And oh, by the way, all your worries and anxieties, can they add anything to your life? Luke chapter 12, we're going to pick it up in verse 13. Here's how the story unfolds. It says, then someone called from the crowd, and this is a large crowd, thousands would be gathered around listening to Jesus teach. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. But, and Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told him a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. It's a large crowd. Someone's gathered, raised their hand. Hey, teacher, can you kind of help our estate planning and settle this? And Jesus realizes the greediness in this individual's heart. He just goes right into it talking about greed and goes, life is not measured by how much you own. He talked about this guy that had barns and there was enough and he tore them down and goes, I'll build bigger ones. And that night he dies. And here's the point that Jesus is trying to drive home is that the meaningless pursuit of more is meaningless. The meaningless pursuit of more is Meaningless. And this guy had enough that God had given him. He was successful. He was wealthy. But he thought, that wasn't enough. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. And I'll have a better life then. And that night, God says, you fool. Now, just FYI, Church 101, if you're new to church, this is your first time to ever step foot in the the doors of our church, you just need to understand, if God calls you a fool, that's not a good thing. Try to like, that's not a term of endearment. Like, oh, you fools. Like, no, 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 you're an idiot is what God's saying. And the reason why God calls this guy a fool is not, hear me carefully, is not because he's wealthy. It's not because he's successful. It's not because he worked really, really hard. He calls him a fool because he devalues his relationship with God. That's the foolishness of it. It's not the barns. It's not the wealth. It's not the success. It's not not any of that stuff. It's that he put all of that above his relationship with God. He is a fool because he devalued his relationship with God. The meaningless pursuit of more is meaningless. But I think 
So often, you and I, we want more. We got to have more, more friends, more money, more relationship, more time, more influence, more cars, more house, more education, more knowledge. We want more. And in light of all of that, we sacrifice our relationship with God. He gets put on the back burner because we're on to the next thing. What's bigger and what's better, that's what I'm after. And here's what I want you to understand here if that is you. And again, you don't need to raise your hand. You don't have to be honest with me. But if you'd be honest and dive to the inside of your heart and go, you know what? I constantly want and need more in my life. Here's what I want you to grasp is that God is bigger and better than more. I don't care what you're pursuing. I don't care what you're going after. I don't care that next thing. When you sacrifice your relationship with God and in place put more above God, that is the foolishness that God is talking about. Nothing wrong with working hard or being wealthy or successful. What is wrong is when you go, you know what? My relationship with God is not that valuable. I'll sacrifice it and I want the next thing. And at some point, you're gonna have to answer the question, how much is enough? Like, what's the number? What's the thing? What's the point? What's the, the size of the house, the amount of cars, the number of vacations, the amount of... At some point you're going, when is enough? Enough. And the problem is, is this pursuit of more. It's this insatiable appetite that never ends. We want more. We go after more. We pursue. We want. We drive. And in the meantime, we sacrifice our relationship with God. And that is the foolishness that Jesus is talking about. Not hard work. Not success but devaluing relationship with God. Let me illustrate this way. It's a silly illustration, but I think you'll get it, all right? So imagine God gives you this. Imagine God gives you $100. You are so excited. You're so grateful. You're so honored that God would entrust you with $100, and you're excited. Then all of a sudden, Satan enters in and goes, oh, hey, by the way, 100 bucks is good, but here's five more dollars in this. Wouldn't $105 be better than 100? And you're going, well, duh, 105 is way better than 100. And so instead of being grateful with what God has given you, you sacrifice it and you pursue after more. And it's hard work, but all of a sudden you've got more. But then the next thing you know is you're just trapped and you can't get out. You've got more. I've got $105 and you walk around like a fool. And the reason why is because you're enslaved and trapped to the desire for more. And you walk around and you're proud and you're bragging, going, look, I've got more. And everybody else is going, yeah, but, but you, you missed out on really what God's given you. Yeah, yeah, no, I've got more. But the problem is, is more so easily entraps us, but we go after it and we grab a hold of it. And the idea is that the, the pursuit of more is always meaningless. There will never be enough to satisfy the appetite that always desires more. And this is what Jesus is talking about, going this endless pursuit. I have barns, I'll tear them down, and I will build bigger ones. And unfortunately, in my line of work, I have seen people do that firsthand, that they destroy their life for the desire of more. They destroy marriage, they destroy kids, they destroy friendships, they destroy careers, they destroy integrity, they destroy their character and reputation. Why? Because I got to have more. And once I get more, then my life will be bigger and better, and then I'll be happy. And they reach that point. But there's always a next step, and there's always a next level. The man was a fool, not because he worked hard, not because he was successful, because he took the relationship with God and said, it's not near as valuable. So then Jesus continues on and he zooms in a little bit in verse 22. Verse 22 says, then turning to his disciples, he's a large crowd, and now he zooms in on his disciples. Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For God feeds them and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Look at verse 25. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Then he goes, look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing as Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers 
that are, that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat, what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. So he goes from like diving into this issue of greed and more to going, listen, because of that, Jesus goes, this is why I tell you, don't worry about everyday life. Where they can have enough food to eat, to, to eat or enough to drink or clothes to wear. Like all of those things, he goes, they don't matter. And the reason why is because your heavenly father already knows. He goes, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And it's a rhetorical question that you and I sitting here today go, well, absolutely they don't. And I think we could all, we could all make the argument that, in fact, it doesn't not only not add it, but it detracts moments away from your life. But notice what Jesus is saying is that the wasted moments of worry are wasted. Like there's literally nothing you can do worrying or filling your heart and mind with anxiety that, that resolves a problem that makes life better. And Jesus is going, listen, listen, look at the flowers and look at the birds. God cares for them and he's certainly going to care for you. And what's fascinating is in this text, Luke specifically mentions that Jesus mentions ravens. Not just look at the birds, but he goes specifically look at ravens. And the reason why that's interesting, because in, in Leviticus chapter 11, ravens, they were considered and deemed unclean birds, unclean animals. So Jesus is going, look at the thing that's unclean and filthy. God cares for that bird. God cares for this flower. And oh, by the way, on the scale of value, you are way higher than any bird or flower. And if God is taking care of the birds and the flowers, he will certainly take care of you. And again, you don't need to raise your hand. You may not be honest with me, but if you would do a deep dive into your heart and go, yeah, there's some, there's some areas of worry. There's some areas of anxiety. There are some areas where I worry about things that I shouldn't. Then just hear me very, very carefully and clearly. You need to understand that God cares and is in control. And maybe you just need to take a deep breath and let it out slowly and be reminded of that fact. He cares for birds and he cares for flowers and he's in control of their provision. And oh, by the way, you are way more valuable to him than any birds or any flowers. Take a deep breath and realize that God cares and is in control. If you understand that, then the question is, is then why do you worry? Like why, do, why does worry come so easily and naturally to so many of us? I'll tell you for me personally why. And this is, this is Chris, and I don't know why you worry, but here it is for me. For, for me, why I think it's so easy for me to personally worry is because for me, worry gives me a false sense of control. If I worry about something long enough, if I'm anxious about something long enough, then I've bought into the lie that I can control it. I can change it, I can manipulate it, I can make it better, I can fix it. And the reality is it's outside of my control that I can do absolutely nothing about it but I've fought in the lie going, listen, if I just worry about enough, then maybe I can control it and fix it. And what God is, is, is trying to say to you and to me today, I believe is God is saying, he cares and he's in control, not you, not me, but our heavenly father. Endless pursuit, the meaningless pursuit of more often leads us to these worrisome, anxiety-filled moments and you and I have to rest in the fact that God cares and is in control. Years ago, and, and if you've been here, coming to our church for years, you know this part of our story, but our son David, who's middle schooler, when he was three months old, had major skull surgery, a pretty serious, serious deal in our family. And Brian and I were, you know, newlyweds, young parents, and it, were, it crushed us to be candid with you. Just when you're when your son has to have surgery, major surgery, it was just, it was a heavy, heavy thing. Anxiety, worry, and all that stuff. And the week leading up to his surgery, and you can ask Brianna about this, the Lord spoke something to us very distinct and very clear that gave us a peace that scripture says that passes all understanding. And the, the, the thing that God told us, the, the week leading up to it, all this worry, all this anxiety, is, is the Lord told us this, is that he said to Chris and Brianna, that he, meaning God, cares more for David than Brianna and I do. That God loves David more than Brianna and I 
empty. And that was a hard thing to understand, but it was this eye-opening thing going, because Brianna and I deeply care and love our son, but to have this realization that as much as we care and love our son, that the God of the universe cares more for him and loves him more than Brianna and I can ever possibly imagine. And we walked through that surgery still with a heavy weight, but with peace, and he made it through. And then since then, he's had a couple other major surgeries that, hear me carefully, it's still a heavy weight to carry as a parent. Now, hear me very careful that. But there is this peace. So, nope, God loves David more than Brianna and I do. And you just have to rest in the fact that God cares and is in control. Now, that doesn't say we don't do all of our homework and all of our research and do all of our things. But at the end of the day, we just got to go, God, you, you care and you're in control and you love David more than we do. I don't know what your story is, but I just need you to hear me very carefully. God cares and is in control. And as we walk through those moments, the Lord just spoke to us. I care and I'm in control. Trust me. Now, just hear me very carefully. Like we absolutely did all of our homework and research and I talked to the doctors and all that stuff. Like I was asking doctors and everything. In fact, I kind of embarrassed Brianna one time in one of his surgeries the doc comes in, you know, you just, you, you, you just carry heavy weight. Doc comes in right before his surgery, the final thing. He says, do y'all you, you have any questions? Talk to me and Brianna. And Brian goes, no, I'm good. I go, yeah, I got a question. He's like, oh, okay. He goes, what's up? I said, how are you doing? And the doc looks at me and goes, what? I go, did, did you have a good night's rest? Did you get in a fight with your wife? Anything going on? And he's like, no, dude, I'm fine. I'm like, all right, all right. And he leaves. Brian goes, why did you do that? I was like, I'm a pastor. If I can help out on any level, I wanted to be there before he operated on my son. Like, I didn't want him, like, mad operating. And so, yeah, I'm going, but at some point, you got to go, it's out of my control, and, it, and it's, it's in God's control, but he cares, and he's in control. But this idea of going, I got to have more, and when you get more, it's not quite enough. So when it's not quite enough, all of a sudden, worry and anxiety begin to fill our hearts, souls, and minds. And Jesus says, listen, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. God cares for them. He will care for you. And so what do you do with all of this? Jesus answers that in verse 31. He says, seek, or it means to pursue or to go after, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to those in need. This will store up for you treasure in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is there, the desires of your heart will also be. The endless pursuit, the meaningless pursuit of more often leads us to these wasted moments of worry. And Jesus goes, listen, 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 listen. Here's what you have to do. Pursue God and trust his provision. I know you want more. I know you desire more, but, but that's not the pursuit of life. And I know you're worried about things that, that are out of your control and what's gonna happen. You just need to understand that God will provide. He knows your needs as a heavenly father. So your command and my command as followers of Jesus is to pursue God and trust his provision. And I know you want more, and I know there's that inside thing of you that's full of worry and anxiety, but what the command is going, listen, listen, if you will pursue God, place him first and foremost above everything else, all these other things will work themselves out. He will meet your every need. It may not be the more that you want, but it will be the things that you need. And so the question is, is do you pursue God or do you pursue more? Do you trust in his provision or trust in your worry and anxiety? Pursue God and trust his provision. Now, I've done more weddings, officiated more weddings than I can count. And just about every wedding that I do, I reference this verse, the verse of seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. And up there on the stage, I look at the bride and the groom and I tell them this verse, they go, listen, uh, think of marriage as a triangle with Jesus at the top and you two on the sides. And the closer you grow to Jesus, the closer you grow to each other. 
the farther away you grow from Jesus, the farther away you, you grow from each other. And I said, now, in marriage, there's going to be some big decisions. Take a job, don't take a job, move, all these different pressure, pressures and stresses, 401ks and retirements and all the things. I said, if you'll put Jesus first and foremost, all those other things will take care of themselves. But if you put any of those things at the top spot of your heart, it will all be a house of cards that will eventually will collapse. But the same is true not just for marriage, the same is true for dating. If you're in the dating world right now, to pursue Jesus to find your value, worth, and identity in him, not in boyfriend or girlfriend. If you try to find value, worth, and identity in boyfriend or girlfriend, you put way too much pressure on them, and at some point, they will disappoint, and it will be all collapsed down. The same is true for your career. You put your career at the top, at some point, you're going to ring whatever proverbial bell of success it is that you want to ring. You're going to get whatever title it is that you want to get. You're going to hit it, and you're going to look around and go, what's next? And it's an empty, meaningless feeling. But if you will pursue Jesus and trust that he will line out all your career path and your retirements and 401ks and exit plans, all of those things will fall into place if you would pursue Jesus. If you would pursue Jesus, he will take care of all your monetary and financial needs. But if you put money at the top spot, you will hit whatever number it is that you want to hit. And at some point you're going to go, is that it? There's got to be, there's got to be more to, than th to, to life than this. I've got the number, I've hit the mark, what's next? It's a house of cards that will eventually collapse. If you'd put Jesus first and foremost and trust him with your money and honor God with your money, then all the other things will take care of themselves. But again, the question is, do you trust God? Do you pursue God? Do you want God or do you want more? Because as, as good as this is, more just is, seems better. But the instant you get more, all of a sudden you're entrapped and you're enslaved to the meaningless pursuit of more. Pursue God and trust his provision. And when I say pursue, I mean go after Jesus with everything that you've got. When I say pursue, when, when we talk about seeking first the kingdom of God, it is not an afterthought. It is not an accessory to your life. It is the top focused thing in your heart and soul and mind. Everything else is secondary. It's going, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? Jesus, how do I see you today? Jesus, what are you doing in my life and my money and my career and my relationships today? I want your will and your way today. Everything else will fall into place. But Jesus, I need you to be first and foremost in my life today. Three months ago, we had something really strange happen with one of our dogs. We have two dachshunds. Uh, the oldest, she's three. The youngest, he's about one. And, uh, and the, the younger one, he's one years old. About three months ago, it's super weird. And maybe if you have dachshunds, we can talk about it afterwards. But all of a sudden, he had a desire to play fetch with a certain red rubber ball. Now, I mean, we've, we've owned dachshunds. I've never had a dachshund. I've never seen a dachshund play fetch. I've seen labs do it. I've seen retrievers do it. But a little teeny tiny, you know, like wiener dog, brings his little red rubber ball, and I threw it, and he just chased after that thing, and he brought it back. And I was like, well, this is fascinating. And so I threw it off the back porch, and he ran off the back porch and out of Hiller and bring it back. And if we never need to get it inside, I throw it in the house, and he runs after this thing. And then I pick up the rubber ball, and his eyes are just locked in on it. He just, like, so I, I kind of do one of this, and he, he kind of does one of those type of things, type of deal. Like, he just moves, and it's only the red rubber ball. No other toy, nothing else, but that red rubber ball, when you pick it up, boy, his ears perk up, and his eyes lock in on it. And then when you throw it, his ears go back, and his eyes are focused, and it's that red rubber ball, and nothing else matters. The same way it should be when you're pursuing Jesus. My eyes are locked in, my heart is locked in on the things that God wants me to do and opinions, culture, world, society, that doesn't matter. It's just white noise that I'm not even paying attention to. I'm focused on the things of God and I'm trusting everything else will fall into place. But the instant Jesus just becomes an accessory, just becomes a thing in your life, all of a sudden you're building a very nice house of cards that looks good with money at the top spot, 
with career at the top spot, with that relationship at the top spot, but eventually it will come crashing down. The meaningless pursuit of more is always meaningless. And the wasted moments of worry are always wasted. And pursuing the things of God, trusting in his provision, they are the things that satisfy the soul. So here's a question I would ask for you to ponder just this week. It's actually two-part question wrapped into one. But the question is this is, what has God given me and am I using it for his glory? What has God given me and am I using it for his glory? This is where you take inventory of your own life. What has God given me and am I using it for his glory? So instead of pursuing more, I'm gonna go, here's what God's given me. He's given me health. He's given me a house. He's given me cars. He's given me relationships. He's given me friendships. He's given me creativity. He's given me a strategic mind, a logistical mind. He's given me a sense of humor. He's given me a position. He's given me influence. He's given me authority. God has given me so many things in my life. Now, the question is not how do I go after more, but how do I use what God has given me for his glory? That's the heart of the Father and why he's giving you the things he's given you. He doesn't give you things so you can go, great, what's next and what's more? He gives you these things so these earthly possessions, these earthly things are used for a heavenly purpose. Earthly things spent to build up earthly possessions and more, it's just meaningless and it is a waste of time. But the earthly possessions, the earthly things you have built using to build heavenly things is an eternal Building heavenly things, it, things that matter. These are the things that change life. These are the things that God wants you to use in your, in your life. The wealth, the houses, the cars, the family, the friends, all of the influence you have going, how do I use this for the glory of God? You can go after more all you want. And many in this room, you're very, very good at acquiring more. You're very smart. You work really hard. And you can pursue after the things the more. And at the end of the, your life, you'll have more than everybody else. You'll win the hungry, hungry hippo game. But at the end of the day, it's just earthly things. And what matters is eternity. What matters is heavenly things. Or you can flip it upside down and go, you know what? I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to be laser focused on him. And I'm going to trust that all the other things will work themselves out. Houses and cars and retirement and insurance and 401ks and kids and relationships, all that stuff. But Jesus, you're first and foremost. I'll finish with this. So I think Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, the wisest, wealthiest king who ever lived. Ecclesiastes was his memoirs kind of at the end of his life. So Solomon had seen everything, done everything, bought literally anything that he wanted, tried everything in life. And he writes Ecclesiastes at the end of his life. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 21, he says this. He goes, some people work wisely with knowledge and skill and must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great strategy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. And even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. Stop right there. And I don't need you to raise your hand, but I'm very confident that so many of you in this room can relate to that. You work super hard to acquiring more and more things, and at night you lie awake and your mind just runs a thousand miles an hour. Because you need more, and you want more, and how do you get more? And all of a sudden there's anxiety and there's work. And it's almost like Solomon shifts gears just a little, a little bit, takes a deep breath in verse 24. He goes, so... I decided that there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? In other words, <laughs> I realized that the pursuit of more is meaningless. So what God has given me, the life that he's given me, the things that he's given me, I'm going to enjoy as a gift from God, I want to use for the glory of God, and I'm going to trust and rest in his provision. Nothing wrong with hard work, nothing wrong with success, nothing wrong with wealth. The problem is, is when you devalue your relationship with God, and that then becomes king of your heart. But if you would go and listen, 
God has given me the light that he's given me. I'm going to rest in the fact that he's given me all that I need according to what he wants me to have. And I'm going to trust and rest in his provision. The meaningless pursuit of more is always meaningless. The wasted moments of worry are always wasted. The question is, is will you pursue God and trust his provision? Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I realize that probably most in this room at some point you placed your faith in Jesus. And you don't have to be honest with me, but I would encourage you to at least be honest with yourself. You want more. You're good at getting more, desiring more, building more. The question is, is when is enough enough? What's the number? What's the amount? Maybe today you need to confess that and go, God, I for far too long I've pursued more instead of pursuing you. Today, Jesus, I put you first and foremost in my life, and I will pursue you above anything else. Maybe you're clinging on to worry and anxiety and buying into this false sense of control. And you just need to hear and remember the fact that God cares and is in control. And for those of you in this room that you've never placed your faith in Jesus, the good news is, is that he loves you and that he cares for you and that you can today. Scripture says, all who call upon the Lord will be saved. If you're ready to do that, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer of salvation. Here, be careful. It's nothing super spiritual about this prayer. It's just a way for me to help lead you with what the Holy Spirit's already doing in your heart. Maybe give you some words around it, but for really, for you today to surrender your life and soul to Jesus. If you're ready to do that, just say something like this. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. Please fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. And I'm going to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for all of us. Forgive us for pursuing more, more than you. Forgive us for clinging to worry and anxiety and trusting in your control and provision. God, my prayer is that today is that as we go out and we look at birds and we look at flowers, God, that we're reminded of your care and your control.